Recording. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning or afternoon for those of you guys over on the Eastern Time Zone. Uh, this is Brad Adams. I am the web chair for Tennessee HFMA, um, and it is my pleasure to be your host for today's webinar. This is the first in a brand new series that we're doing called Tennessee Trains on Tuesday, and we're going to be offering a free monthly webinar. Um, Hope typically on the second Tuesday of every month, um, and this whole program is really the brainchild of Buffy Loveday, who is our co-chair for education this year. Um, so she is going to be, you know, coordinating these and putting these together going forward. Um, Gail Culpepper, who is our CPE coordinator, is working uh, with NASBA so that hopefully down the road we can get approved so that we can actually offer um, CPE certificates. Um, for the webinars going forward for all of you CPAs um, that are on the line. Um, so a couple of housekeeping matters really quickly today. Um, if you've got any questions um, or you're having any problems with the webinar, there's a questions uh, box you can submit your questions through. So go ahead and do that. I'll be monitoring those. Also, we'll have time to take questions. So if you're connected with audio um, with a microphone, either through your phone or if you've got a microphone on your computer, um, you've got a raise hand option. So when we get into time for discussion and questions, um, if you do have a question, click that raise hand and then I'll know um, you want to talk and I can go in and unmute um, your microphone and you can uh, interact with our presenters who I get to introduce now. Um, first off, we've got Karen Freemuth. Karen is a regional director with MDON's Patient and Consumer Billing um, and Payment Solutions Division in the Southeast. She's got over 10 years of healthcare industry experience, um, focusing on uh, assisting clients to improve revenue cycle efficiencies um, and increase self-pay collections. Uh, she's worked with providers across the country, um, helping them to design um, integrated online billing and payment methods. Karen is a wife and the mother of twins. Um, our second presenter today is Joy Finnan. Um, Joy works at Vanguard here in Nashville, um, and she is the she's been in the healthcare and revenue cycle side of things for over 15 years. Um, with stints in the business office, financed and managed care contracting. Um, she's been with Vanguard in both their San Antonio and Chicago markets, um, and just came here to the corporate offices in Nashville last November which, as we all probably saw on the paper yesterday, is probably going to be shifting around a little bit again um, with the possible tenant acquisition. Um, so she currently reads the revenue cycle teams for vendor implementations and process standardization. So without further ado, um, I'm going to turn it over to our speakers. Thank you so much, Brad and Buffy, for having us on today. Um, and thank you, the Tennessee chapter. Um, this session is going to be talking about sophisticated tools to expedite cash collections and simplifying the business of healthcare if that's really a way that we can even do that. Um, I know it's getting more and more challenging these days, especially with the upcoming ACA changes and challenges. We're um, wanting to be on the forefront of innovation for you, and this, is, this discussion today is just to share some best practices that I have found as well as best practices that Joy does within the Vanguard Health System as well. So a pleasure to be here today. Again, as Brad said, I am um, with the Patient Billing and Payment Suite of MDM. I cover the Southeast region. And Joy, I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself really quickly and tell us a little bit about Vanguard as well. And then we'll go ahead and go into the presentation. Hi, this is Joy. Um, as Brad mentioned, I have worked in healthcare for several years. Um, I was actually part of the Baptist Health System in San Antonio during the um, 2003 Vanguard acquisition um, of that hospital system there. Um, Vanguard has 28 hospitals across the country, and um, our focus, of course, is you know, patient satisfaction. We are um, driven to come up with new ways of improving our revenue cycle process, and um, you know, I do work with the business offices and the patient access teams in the different markets to try to, you know, help them streamline processes and improve both their collection rates from the patients as well as the insurance companies. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So again, this conversation is going to be relative to how to get and, and improve your self-pay tools 
to communicate and accelerate communications to patients uh, via all the channels available, as well as provide innovations and self-service tools for your patient population to arm them um, with the channels and preferences in which they want to pay to get you paid faster. So without further ado, go ahead and change it. It's neat. Um, been in the healthcare business for about 10 years, and uh, I have been in different roles within MDON. I get to talk to a lot of people. I go to a lot of events and uh, f facilities, CIOs, CFOs, patient um, uh, patient directors, and, and leaders such as yourself in the self-pay receivables department. I always ask, you know, what's keeping you up at night? What what's got your goose and what you know what is really a challenge for you these days and it's amazing how little sleep everyone's getting these days especially with all the changes in healthcare coming about but it's also amazing that I hear the same things over and over no matter if it's in the west or the east or if it's a 25 bed facility or a thousand bed facility whether you're collecting a million dollars or a billion dollars it's a very 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 consistent message that the first thing always hear is they have a challenge reading their statements the patient population is very confused. They want to help. Um, they want to be able to be armed with a ability to combine statements. Patients are calling, saying, "Gosh, I always I get so many. I don't even know which one I'm supposed to pay." It's amazing, believe it or not. It takes about three statements before a patient submits payment. And if those three statements are coming from multiple entities within a health system, it's very, very confusing to the patient. So I would suggest and one of the best practices that I would recommend is review what you're sending and leverage the HFMA's best practices within the patient-friendly initiative. And that preference and that recommendation is to send two statements. So once you're able to define that the claim was adjudicated and there is a self-pay due responsibility of that patient, drop it as quickly as possible. And then give them an amount of time, a reasonable amount of time to pay that, whether that be 15 days, 20 days or 30 days, whatever your policy is, and then drop a second statement with the Dunning message that's letting them know that they've already received one or should have received one, and this is the second correspondence. And then from there, the recommendation with patient-friendly initiative through the HFMA is to send soft collection letters, a pass due, a gentle pass due notification, a second notice, and then a final notice, all changing colors, changing verbiage, but keeping the remit coupon the same of what was due on the very first bill that was dropped. And then whatever your policy or process is to utilize a collection agency to then go after a little more harder um, and relative to, um, to the messaging of that particular aged account. Work with a partner that to, can help you define that statement and letter series. Again, one that keeps the concept and keeps the branding and the image consistent. But again, whereas it's changing and looking at a different color scheme and different messaging so that you can open up the statement, it's not the same statement four times over and the Dunning message is only changed. We're literally changing the entire paper concept and look and feel of that particular um, item. And then going back to the request of combined statements. It's very difficult to combine statements within a health system with um, different software platforms or even the timing of the, um, of the drop of the statement. Physicians may drop a 28-day cycle, whereas a hosp the hospital side might drop right when the bill is due. So I work with a partner that can help you define business logic that will help you combine those and really get bigger bang for your buck to reduce the cost associated with getting those statements out in the mail and combining as many as possible. But then you need to also identify you're getting one coupon in then. So do you have a central business office that will define that payment and, who, and the method of the payment? Or do you need, again, another partner that can help you allocate the funds and split the payments out on that statement? So concept is you have multiple entities within the system. You've defined a very clear and concise statement that's showing the different services that were rendered across the organization. And now you're working with a partner to expedite that into the mail stream get it into the, um, the, the mailbox or the, the, e the delivery method of email or um, et cetera of that particular patient. And then when that remit comes back, those funds are being allocated perhaps to the aged, most aged account uh, or aged service or physicians first. It needs to go into multiple bank accounts 
multiple merchant accounts with multiple reporting. It can be done, just a little difficult in the paper world. Just work with a partner that can help you do that. So our overall goal is to eliminate the confusion of each correspondence, combine bills where applicable and where we can, so that the health system is providing cost savings and getting that patient satisfaction. As well as, we'll talk about the next couple ones that I hear often, is arming the patients with innovative ways to eliminate the USPS delay and deploy more self-service tools to eliminate manual and unnecessary labor on the provider side. Some other concepts that I want to share with you as well uh, as, as it relates to a correspondence that you want to send out is utilize an expertise with the experience in the partner that provides suggestions and best practices so that your patient has the best in breed statement that clearly shows how they can pay. And I know this is a little um, probably hard to see on your screen, but we'll, I'll try to show as clearly as I can as we talk through this. So we want to show how they can pay. Images and logos are um, key. So having those images and logos of the MasterCard, Discover, Visa, American Express, and even a check. People do pay by check still these days. It's unbelievable. Icons for payment. If I can bring your eyes down to the bottom, this is clearly showing that the, um, this facility allows for online payment, a payment by phone or an IVR, or the traditional snail mail, as well as a QR code. Work with a partner that can help you, again, be innovative. These QR codes are um, this particular QR code. If I had a smart device, I could read this code, and it would automatically drop me to the payment site of Catholic Health Partners, and I can make this payment of $170 right there. Combining the data, we want to make sure, again, if we can combine data at where is uh, um, applicable, the data comes over to your partner, they should be able to facilitate and, and um, design a very clear and readable, understandable statement series for you as well as financial aid. We know it's very, very important to have financial aid information earlier within the patient communication. First, first statement out to show that there's any financial assistance that is needed, what the patient needs to do or who they can call to get there. We're in a very unique situation where as middle class individuals are, are being charged um, more because out of pocket and in the challenging and uh, in, in the challenging workforce today, they might be struggling a little bit more than they have ever before. So they are a little un, unsure and unaware of what they need to do. So creating that um, information early is definitely a best practice recommended. As well as the insurance information, showing a primary and secondary insurance. If I have a, a primary insurance and my secondary is not shown, I'm absolutely going to call the business office to share with them that my secondary insurance wasn't uh, provided on my statement, and maybe that is where the $170 needs to come from. So I'm helping you clean up your insurance information within your system, as well as getting you paid that faster through the secondary. And then if there's a self-pay owed after that, then that would be my responsibility as a patient to pay. And the last one is the messaging area. Again, work with a partner that can provide you additional information and resources relative to the Dunning messages that your HIS system is offering. So your HIS system has the um, applicable Dunning messages that you may or may not be happy with. If you work with a partner that can um, chart those out and you can share with them a table that says, here are all of my Dunning messages, but I don't want those, I don't like those, or I want to add to them to make it, again, a clearer correspondence. If you ever see this um, Dunning message, I want you to print this instead. And also have open form text. So if you ever want always information showing, thank you for choosing the facility for your health care needs or online options are available, be able to work with a, a partner that has functionality to be able to do that and, um, and be able to correspond the way in which you want to correspond to your patient population. It's one thing I definitely want to get across as we speak today is that you should be in control of what your patients receive, even though your data might be restrictive. The partner should be able to help fill any gaps. All these suggestions will reduce costs, get you paid faster, reduce those patient calls coming into your call center asking about a statement or, or kind of correspondence coming through, improve patient satisfaction, referrals, and repeat business. It will also eliminate or reallocate posters. If you're utilizing a self-paid lockbox through a partner, 
that will be an automation. And then all of those funds will be appropriately allocated as that secret sauce I kind of shared with the um, lockbox um, for the combined bills. And Joy, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to you. And you can kind of share with us what keeps you awake these days and how your self-pay print process works and when you drop statements, what your AR days outstanding are, and just give us some of your best practices relative to your patient correspondence within your different markets. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Um, well, what keeps a lot of us up at night are the changes in healthcare and the continued need for strength of volumes and collections. And a large part of the issues that we have with a continuous increase in specifically patient collections is the insurance companies constantly changing, um, you know, patient portions of the deductibles and out-of-pocket um, continue to rise, as well as the, you know, creative plans that they come up with limited coverage. <clears throat> So the challenge is to collect the patient portions as quickly and cost effectively as possible while retaining the patient loyalty and satisfaction. Um, we have, we do have a lot of the, <clears throat> the tools um, from MDON and we have been able to reduce our AR days significantly over the past year, um, partly from our revenue cycle um, initiatives as well as the um, MDON tools. Um, we have been able to reduce about five days. Um, which is great, um, but really the beginning point is the eligibility, and that, that is key. And I know it's not on one of these slides, but to, to get the patient out of pocket and the deductible amounts um, up front, and we can talk about it a little bit later on, that is very important, of course, um, to be able to communicate right away to the patient what their portions are going to be or their estimated portions are going to be. That gives them a little bit more time um, to gather the funds, and of course, if they can pay that day, that's ideal. We do use the um, the express bill and also the return mail, which is key, only because the last thing you want to do is continue, you know, incurring costs of sending statements to the wrong place. Um, we also we also allow the patients to pay online. They can pay by phone. We also have the voice recognition which Karen mentioned, um, which is very convenient to the patient. And, um, and then, of course, the snail mail payments. Um, we have seen an increase from the patients, of course, paying electronically. I think as things change um, with the technology, you know, people, younger people are using more technology, and we've been trying to do a lot with our email capture. Um, we're still ramping that up quite a bit. But, you know, as time goes on, I think we'll see a lot more of patients paying online, paying over the phone, and, um, and using those electronic tools versus the snail mail. That is perfect. Thank you, Joy. And actually it leads me into exactly the second thing that I hear all of the time um, as a consistent uh, item that keeps, keeps you up at night, and that's the request the, the patient population has for self-service tools. So everyone's working longer days, they're traveling, the ability to capture and correspond timely by snail mail is a thing of the past. So people want alternative ways to correspond and pay outstanding bills. This is a tech-savvy world, very, very self-service oriented. So we want to make sure that um, you, these facilities and your providers are not only um, providing a print solution to correspond with those that would like that channel of um, method of payment, but also arming your patient population with the ability to pay online, to pay on self-service tools, whether it be a point of service collection, me walking into the facility and making a payment or calling over the phone to the facility, as well as an IVR or pay by phone. Um, kiosks seem to be very, very important these days as well and, and starting to become uh, more popular. And then e-delivery, as Joy just stated. So working with a partner, and I'm going to kind of talk through these a little bit more. So allowing the patient to be able to get into a payment engine, um, uh, pay by online, whether it be by the QR code that I showed you on that statement before or going into the web portal of the, of the provider and making a payment getting in um, and getting out. So a frequent, I, I would say like um, a non-frequent flyer, it uh, would be someone like me, knock on wood, I'm a healthy individual, but I'm clumsy. So perhaps I fell and, and uh, 
broke my leg. I always self-pay. Well, I'm an online bill payer. I travel. So if you send me a bill, unfortunately, if I travel on Monday, I'm not going to look at my mail until Saturday. And then by the time I find the stamp in my house, I'm not going to probably mail it out till the next week. So unfortunately, I am messing your AR days up just as a consumer that is traveling. However, if you armed me with a statement or perhaps a, a document within my email, I will most likely pay you that same day I got that correspondence. So that's what we want to do. We want to arm you with um, innovative ways that um, making sure that you, you look within your partnerships or you look within out, outside of your partnerships today to make sure that if it's your print vendor or if it's a new vendor, um, that you're looking at ways in which they can help you reduce costs associated with your correspondence to your um, patient community, as well as maybe reduce them to do email in a very secure method. Um, if you have a kiosk unit or if you're looking at a kiosk unit, a lot of times they're for scheduling or um, pre-reg. But if you've got someone utilizing a self-service tool, I encourage the conversation to be with internally this, gosh, if we have someone on the self-service tool, if they've got an outstanding bill, how cool would it be to be able to say, would you like to see your statement right now? It's an outstanding bill. You can actually pay right now as well. Um, and then being able to reallocate the manual labor somewhere to call into your um, your facility to make a payment having that directory assistant or the operator ask the question do you have the bill in front of you I do would you like to go ahead and go into our our pay by phone automated tool absolutely so you've now allowed your resources to work on heavier higher dollar challenged accounts and had that person that would be very willing to utilize a self service tool for payment and utilizing that faster, um, it would be a smarter and, and a better ROI to get, capture that money and utilize um, resources better within your facility. So the goal um, on any patient correspondence, really whether it's health and wellness, and outbound correspondence, look into it and look into an email. Um, I know a lot of the HIS systems now are asking for email. It's usually a recommended field, but maybe one in which you're not capturing today. I encourage the conversation again internally to start trying to capture email addresses, seeing if the patient would like to be corresponded with any correspondence going out from your facility within an email, and certainly for any payment methodology as well, if they would like to have that all via email. Again, me being a traveler, me being an online bill payer within all of my consumer bills, I, um, uh, I am a, um, a stickier um, individual with Verizon or with my uh, waste management because they, ha they have given me and empowered me self-service tools to make my payments faster and seamlessly remotely from the snail mail. Uh, as well as Joy talked a little bit about um, the return mail program. So again, utilizing the strength of uh, a partnership that's going to help you make sure that the correspondence that you're sending out via the snail mail is the best address available. As Joy said, stated, you don't want to continue to send out correspondences to bogus addresses that's not going to get you paid and it's just going to be costly. It's about $3.00. Uh, uh, um, individual transaction on return mail for you to actually have to return it back, work it to find a better address, and then remail it out. Not not even incorporating any of the AR days outstanding due to that bad correspondence. So, going back to um, accelerating the outbound billing, utilize and um, really push all limits to be able to provide the best in breed print document. Uh, look into and perhaps allow for email correspondence if that's the preferred way that your patient wants to be responded to, communicated with, return mail manager programs, utilize the best, um, and, and this is really at the forefront. So this is at, um, at patient access, making sure that you're capturing the right address with cleaner data in so that as the data feeds through the system to an outbound statement or um, any type of a correspondence that you've got clean data in for clean data out. And then any document imaging. Most um, providers today have a document, document imaging tool. So again, 
leverage and work with a partner that's going to be able to fuel that engine with any correspondence that they send out so that you're owning those documents for the life of the document and you're not having to utilize the provider or the partner to store that, that um, and fuel that image for you. And then again, um, all that acceleration of outbound correspondence or billing equals improved AR performance when you expand inbound payment channels. So allowing your patients the ability and the preference in which they want to pay, whether that be um, with snail mail and having that combined statement, and with that combined statement, the allocation of funds into the appropriate merchant account via a self-pay lockbox, or those frequent flyers that are coming to your facility quite often, they're a neighbor of the facility and they're just walking in to make that payment, arming your individuals at any patient access level an opportunity to take that payment at point of service. Again, arming your individual um, uh, websites with a payment online engine to be able to get in and make a payment or get in as a frequent flyer, enroll, create budget plans, create a wallet, similar to if any of those are on the phone that are online bill payers with your bank or your credit card or um, PayPal, you have your credit card in like a virtual wallet. And those kind of functionalities are certainly available in the marketplace today for an online payment engine for providers as well. And then an IVR tool. So an IVR being a pay over phone, because you're going to have those, those individuals that don't have stamps, they don't like snail mail, they're not comfortable, perhaps they don't have internet access or a computer, they're not a frequent flyer or a neighbor of their facility, but they would absolutely call on the phone and go through an IVR. So again, arming your individuals with all the ways in which, you can, which they can pay. And then the last thing, oops, Joy, you know what, I would like to just... Um, jump in real quickly and ask you, you've used a lot of this stuff, so um, can you go into a little bit more detail of how you've deployed these and educated your patient population on these and any adoption rates or any type of best practices that you've had and successes in utilizing these tools? Um, yeah, well, first of all, we do, like you were mentioning, validate the address, and one of the things that we've tried to roll out is training the upfront staff. Um, usually registrars sometimes aren't as comfortable um, collecting from patients. So we really tried to roll out the um, training of the registrars being so, you know, quasi-collectors. And then also we've really been trying to ramp up the ability internally to clearly provide the patient portions up front. Um, along with the customer service, they do allow um, the upfront staff to set up payment arrangements using the um, e-cashiering tool, um, as well as let the customers know that you know, if they go home and can make the payment, you know, from home, you can use the web tools once they receive their statement, as well as calling in again to our customer service lines and, and setting up payment plans at that point. So we try to do it up front to provide the communication to the patients while they're here, as well as the statements are fairly clear on their options and routes to make payments. And again, we've really tried to do more of the online um, payments um, because, again, that does reduce costs. And what we've seen is uh, right now, I believe, we're looking at about 11% is electronically collected through either the credit cards or the e-cashiering the, the, and the voice response payments. So um, we hope to continue to see that rise um, because, again, you know, based on the first statement, to get those upfront electronic collections is, of course, the route that we want to take in addition to upfront collections at the point of service. That's great. And um, Joy, I know that I've talked with you and, and you're working on um, an email. So you're actually go going into the next, the next generation of correspondence to your patient populations, whereas you are collecting those email addresses and you're working towards asking that individual patient to say, hey, do, do you want all of your correspondence from Vanguard Health to be email? And if so, I'm going to send you an enrollment email. I'm going to solicit you to enroll. And once you enroll with credentials, from that point on, any document that you send is literally going to email, correct? Yes, we are working to roll that out and implement that new process. We're, I think the, the, the hardest part at this point is trying to capture those emails. A lot of people don't necessarily at this point, some of the older populations don't either have an email address or right. don't want to provide it, but that is something that we ramped up. And we've seen improvements um, over time, uh, you know, getting those emails and making sure that the registrars are asking for it as well. So they need to ask for it to be able to get it back. That's right. That's right. 
Well, Brad, before I go into the next slide, I um, just want to open up. Is there any questions? See, I have got uh, <clears throat> one here, and the question is, uh, many of today's patients do not have checking accounts. Um, what alternatives do you recommend to help improve collections from this patient class? Um, the credit card then, so and any debit card that has a credit card logo on it, um, and then point of service collections would be able to capture certainly cash or um, money orders, cashiers, checks, etc. Okay. So I, some facilities are actually, and maybe Joy, you have some information on this, but some facilities are actually looking at going into a PayPal um, payment methodology. I have not worked with any of those yet, but I have heard that buzz out in the marketplace. Um, yeah, we haven't really we haven't really looked to PayPal, um, but usually if they have a PayPal of some sort, they'll have some kind of electronic method to pay, either via credit card or checking account. But you know, usually a debit card is usually the way, or credit card is normally the way that we get it if there is no checking account. Yeah, yeah, and then again, also some partners um, have the ability to take money through a, a savings account as well. So again, just making sure that you ask the partner what, what methodologies that they're able to accept that payment through online or point of service collection tools. Right. And like Karen said, we always take cash as well. That's right. Cash works. <laughs> Great. And this is Brad again, and, and this is just my, my follow-up to that. And I would think a large portion of that patient population that does not have checking accounts may very well qualify for your charity care program. Um, so we might, you might not even be attempting to collect um, from them as well. Correct. Perfect. Good point. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? Actually, um, near the end. Oh, right. oh, I was just seeing if there's anybody else with questions out there. I don't see anything in. So um, you can go ahead, or I wrote down some more questions uh, that we can cover when we get to the end. Okay, excellent. I'll go on to the next one then, and okay. we'll go ahead and address those questions for sure. Um, and then the last item that I hear often is um, that's keeping everyone up at night is changing the behavior associated with asking for money. And Joy kind of talked through this of trying to find estimates and collecting money sooner at patient access, and that's absolutely um, a best and breed um, uh, best practice. Is arming anyone within your infrastructure the ability to have a point of service collection tool to be able to capture any type of methodology of money that we just kind of talked through and asking for that money pre-service. So a scenario just again that happened to me recently is that I had a procedure done three days before, it was a scheduled procedure, so three days before the procedure they called me at home, reminded me of the procedure, reminded me that I couldn't eat after midnight that night, needed a driver, park at the awning at the green side of the building, et cetera, et cetera. And then they asked me, hey, by the way, we noticed that you have a $45 copay for this and your estimation is going to be X. Would you like me to go ahead and take that payment right now so that we just need to worry about your health and wellness that day versus the financials of this visit? And it was outstanding because I was able to take out my credit card, they took it over the phone, they put it into the point of service collection tool, and they gave me um, an email receipt that was in my inbox when I hung up the phone with them. So that's what the kind of encouragement is of being able to do some estimations. And if you don't even do estimations, at least running the eligibility to check what, um, what is needed from the patient and then collecting that earlier. Or when you're having that individual in in front of you for a service, whether it's through ER or another scheduled event, to be able to ask for that money, or if they cannot pay the full amount to start, and Joy said this as well, is to create a, a payment plan right there. So utilizing a tool that's going to allow you to create a payment plan before they leave your facility. 70% of um, monies that are owed, when the individual leaves the facility, you're not going to get paid. You're not going to get paid from them. So setting payment plans up earlier, asking for money earlier, and then collecting whenever you can, utilizing a tool that's going to provide an audit, tracking, and controlling um, of each individual within your facility for um, activity and productivity, and maybe even some um, uh, arming those drawers to your collection agencies as well. So there's a lot of really neat ways that you can expedite and um, 
and utilize a point of service collection tool within your entire infrastructure and extend it out to where really anywhere your cash is going out for payment um, to be able to have a tool that's going to audit, track, and receive. So Joy, I'm going to turn it over to you again. I know there's a lot of unknowns with the ACA coming up and that you're doing a, a lot of really neat things. I know we talked a little bit about it again, but maybe just reiterate again what your facilities are doing, not only with the upcoming ACA changes and the unknowns relative to that, but also within your entire internal and external process of being able to collect that money sooner. Um, additionally, really, if you can kind of walk us through what when, when a patient comes in within your facility, what happens in the, in the life cycle of that financial encounter. Yeah, so to bring up, we, we have tried to consolidate um, some of our staff in what's called the Pre-Ridge Area or Financial Clearance Center. And what they're doing is, you know, they'll actually verify the insurance benefits if the patient does have them, or they will give an estimate as well up front of what the patient out of pocket is going to be um, due either, like you said, before the service or at the, the day of the service. Um, also, if the patient has come in and it's not, you know, like a pre-reg type of service, if it's more, you know, coming to the emergency room and then they're admitted or something, at the point of discharge, we also are, are trying to get the patient's estimates as well. And what we've used for this is a combination between the MDON eligibility um, that delivers the deductible and what's met and the out-of-pocket max and all that stuff. And we've built a, like a homegrown tool internally that uses historical information because one of the challenges that we've always encountered was the coinsurance percentage and, of course, you know, how much of the deductible is going to be needed. A lot of hospitals, you know, you get to the point where, you know, you know these deductibles are getting bigger and bigger. And, you know, a patient might have a $5,000 deductible at the beginning of the year. I mean, what do you do? You don't know what the patient is going to owe because of all the contracts with the insurance companies. So do you just ask the patient for the full 5000 And so what we've tried to move to is using our internal homegrown system and the eligibility information that comes from the MD on run is you know, to give the patient a better estimate based on the procedure that they're having or the procedure that was performed. To say, okay, historically this is what we're seeing is due um, from a contract perspective or from a Medicare payment perspective. So taking into account here's your deductible, here's the unmet portion of it, here's your coinsurance amount, here's your max out of pocket. This gives the, the people up front that are trying to collect those portions more confidence in what they're asking the patient to pay. And they're better, I guess, more effective in trying to collect it. You know, if a, if a registrar is up front and they're trying to collect $5,000, the patient's asking them, well, why do you want $5,000 from me? You know, it, it gives them that information to be able to better explain to the patient, this is why I'm asking for this amount, blah, blah, blah. So that's what we're trying to do, to collect more at the point of service and be a little more aggressive to get that money and to schedule those payment arrangements, like you said. Awesome. All right. And as we um, work to wrap up and certainly address any questions that we have, again, um, just a successful partnerships to support your AR performance is really the goal here. Again, trying to simplify healthcare um, and simplify the correspondence that are going out. So again, working with a partner that's going to help you with a statement design and series that's going to help arm that individual with exactly what they got, why they got it, how they can make payment, and all the ways in which you're allowing that individual to, to take that payment whether, again, be by e-delivery e notification of that, of um, online payment, a voice collection, or a point of service. E-delivery, it's a new, it's a, it's a new one. Um, however, it's definitely one in which it's going to fast track. Um, Vanguard's getting on this, and so are many, many others that are literally asking their patient populations, can I take your email address? Would you like our correspondence to be through email going forward? Return mail manager, again, Joy talked about this as well, making sure that the delivery of the correspondence, whether it be email or whether it be snail mail, is going to the right person, the right email address, the right um, snail mail address to make sure that you are getting it to the right person for that payment to come back through to you. 
the lockbox services, a patient lockbox service. There's also a wholesale lockbox service, which automates 835s from the payer. Um, however, the patient lockbox, being able to allocate funds from a combined billing statement or to allocate funds or reduce the posters associated with um, self-pay remits coming back in. Uh, again, efficiencies relative to correspondence is key. Digital image and storage, owning the images that you're sending to your patient population, making sure that you are owning them, um, certainly a best in breed. As, as well as being able to reduce the call time associated. So not only do we want to equip and arm your individuals with clear correspondence in ways in which they can pay you faster, all of that's going to make for a stickier patient that's going to stay with you. I've been with the same bank for um, over 15 years because I know how to balance my checkbook in a matter of three minutes on their online tool. So when your patient is um, enrolled into your online, they're going to continue to come back to you because they can now correspond with you online, they can pay online, they can get their email delivery from online, they can change their preferences, whether it be, um, or, or change their demographic, their change of address, or, or, or put their credit card in there to where literally on a phone they can go in accept that, that uh, delivery of that email, that statement that's due, go into the statement, apply the credit card that they already have on file, and take that payment. It could be in less than 30 seconds to get that payment to you. And then the voice, the IVR, again, just making sure that you've got all, all of the preferences in which the patient wants to pay. Point of service collection, capturing that money earlier within the patient encounter, uh, and then being able to capture it really in, in any cycle of that patient financial um, and then inserts. We don't really talk about this too, too much, but absolutely arming your statements or providing inserts within your statement, very similar to consumers. Um, I'm sure that within your Verizon bill or your Kohl's credit card or your um, any type, Macy's, Nordstrom's, you're getting little inserts of perhaps a discount or a sale. We can absolutely um, utilize your print vendor to perhaps put in some health and wellness, put in some information relative to anything that's coming up with ACA. So if they need to enroll, if they've hit a demographic or a, a financials, well, I think it's 138% above poverty level would meet it. Um, don't, don't quote me on that one, but uh, you can absolutely utilize your partners to, to help you with that information. But to deploy and communicate sooner and utilize your statements to do that so that you, it's the cost effective and the ROI is absolutely there. And then going into the last screen, we just want to again arm you today with sophisticated tools that will um, expedite cash collections and simplify um, the, the different trends and the different uh, businesses of the healthcare organizations and different entities that you have within. Joy has provided us so many great best practices that Vanguard is doing and hopefully the information that was on these screenshots and that I address with you today is just my conversations throughout with different providers across the, con the country because uh, it's definitely proven that it, we've been able to share this information and arm them with tools that will improve their AR performance and it has, clearly Joy said, within five days already, reduce that bad debt, getting that paid faster, increase cash collections at any point of the financial encounter, decrease that call volume. We really want to either decrease or eliminate the call volume by giving a better correspondence Lower costs, um, email is going to eliminate the USPS 46 cents, which seems to be going up annually. Greater patient satisfaction, we want to make sure that those patient SAT scores are going, um, at, going high and, and you're getting that repeat business and the referrals. Um, and improved internal efficiencies, so not only with the reduction of costs and the efficiencies, that all the internal efficiencies are also going well. Innovations, again, I can't encourage enough to utilize a vendor that's going to be able to provide innovations and, and continue to help you grow and improve your AR management. And then an ease of implementation. You definitely want to work with a partner that's going to be providing you all of these and it's not going to be heavy lifting on your IT. We know IT is very, very busy these days. So someone that can actually take the heavy lifting on and deploy these tools for you and for your patient population to make it a seamless, a win-win situation. And with that, I'll go ahead and Brad, turn it over to you for additional questions. 
Thank you, Karen. Um, if anybody's got any questions, you can type it in the box or uh, go ahead and raise your hand and um, we can get you involved in the conversation here um, while we give people a chance to do that. One of the things um, that you were talking about was on the information that's included in statements in the insert and th this would apply much more to an outpatient uh, provider, but could you include like upcoming appointments um, on that statement or as an insert or would that present a potential uh, HIPAA issue? No, absolutely. Any type of file format that would come in with, and it could even be demographically or uh, through any type of revenue code, financial class, you can really do any type of business logic relative to an if-then theory. So if you ever see this financial class, please put this on it. Or if you ever see this code, um, that's always going to be relative to a diabetic client patient, so maybe we need to arm them with, hey, there's going to be a diabetic um, health and wellness clinic coming up, please you know, enroll or, or what have you. So absolutely, I encourage that. And then let's see, we, does it not appear that we have got uh, any other questions um, from our audience? So I'd like to thank you ladies for, for taking time out of your schedule today. Um, to be here with us and, and help us kick off, and I think a great style, um, our new webinar series that, as I said before, Buffy Love Day has, has so kindly uh, worked to put together for us. Um, and can you go to the next slide, Karen? Do you have the... polling question? Oh, yep, absolutely. Oh. And then is there polling questions as well? We, we can go ahead and do a couple of those if you like. Let's go ahead and I am going to put the first one up there. So everybody should see that, and we'll give you just a couple minutes, and this will give us a little bit of feedback. Um, and while you're doing that, uh, just a couple other housekeeping items here. Um, so everybody who was in attendance today, um, you'll probably get an email from me in the next uh, day, day and a half. Uh, with a link to go out and um, do the survey. We like to do surveys after all of our education sessions. It helps us um, to, to kind of know what, what's of interest to you, what's working, what's not working, particularly on the webinars since we're still, you know, new at these to an extent. We've only done a handful. helps us to better know um, what we need to change up to make these uh, more effective. And it looks like probably everybody who is going to vote has voted. So I'm going to close that poll and let's see here. I can share the results. So as we can see everybody you know agreed online payment portals and point of service are ways. Um, other things, you know, patient, and I wonder if this is, rather than what can you do, I think a lot of people want to answer what are their systems doing. Um, obviously with patient statements, e-delivery, and IVR. Um, there we go. So, um, as I said, this is the first of a new series in webinars. We not only have got a lot of these coming up, we've got a lot of other exciting events coming up um, for Tennessee HFMA. Um, I've got a listing here of a couple of, of ones coming up just in the month of July here. Um, we have got our first joint meeting with the East Tennessee um, Healthcare Executives Association, uh, which is a chapter of the AHCE, I think, if I'm remembering that correctly, the, the American College of Healthcare Executives. Um, and that's coming up uh, July 10th in Knoxville. Um, and you're going to be able to earn some CPE credits for that. Our next webinar in the series um, is actually going to be on a Friday instead of a Tuesday. We just couldn't get scheduling uh, to work out with the speaker. Uh, but that topic is going to be on labor management and optimization, um, which is something we're in the process of working at here at Vanderbilt. So I'm really interested um, in that one. And then also just sent out an email today. Um, we are partnering with Cahaba um, to co-host their uh, annual jurisdiction uh, meeting. And so that's going to be in Nashville on July 18th, and you're going to be able to get three CPEs uh, for going to that, and that is going to be a free event. We've also got lots of other stuff coming up. We've got the Cahaba Road Shows in September. Um, we've got the Fall Institute, the TSCPA Healthcare Conference, um, Tri-State and Dixie. So all those things are coming up. 
Um, so be sure to mark your calendar, or you can always go out to the website um, and go to our calendar to view that, plus all the national webinars and everything, all the other education opportunities that we've got coming up. Um, so that's really all I've got, ladies. Any parting comments? Just thank you again for allowing us the opportunity to, to join your event today, and we appreciate it greatly. And Joy, thank you so much for being a great co-host. I appreciate your um, engagement and all of your best practice information. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. We will see you uh, next month.